morning. Good morning again. I'm Garvita Kapoor. I'm the Senior Director of Digital Technology at the New York Public Library. Um, New York Public Library is one of the largest uh, public library systems in the country, and uh, it has a mission of providing free knowledge and um, access to information for all our patrons. So today I'll be talking to you about synthetic content. In the digital economy, content is king, and the quality and veracity of the content matters. So where does synthetic content fit into this? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today's agenda is what is synthetic content, a very brief history, walking through the uncanny valley, and uh, what can we do with synthetic content, and how, what are some responsible things we should be doing. Uh, synthetic content is basically content generated with the help of algorithms. It can be audio, video, text, or an image. So anything generated with the help of generative AI tools like Dolly, uh, Perplexity, ChatGPT is all synthetic content. Deep fakes and non-consensual intimate images are a subset of synthetic content. That's a subject we won't be digging into today. <coughs> So with a show of hands, how many of you have used some sort of generative AI? That's great. So everybody's familiar with what synthetic content is. So synthetic content is nothing new. It's been around for a while. So, uh, content generated with CGI is also synthetic content. Bigarian movies, Tron, Matrix, Jurassic Park, all of these um, movies use synthetic content, though they were created with an entirely different set of tool set and skills. Earlier synthetic content was limited to basic computer graphics and animations, and achieving the realism needed to, for high production value required a lot of time, advanced tool skill set, and lots of money. Synthetic content has drastically transformed from rudimentary, well, not really that rudimentary, but you know, uh, computer-generated graphics to sophisticated AI-powered media, <coughs> excuse me, media indistinguishable from reality. The last five years have been marked by exponential growth um, in capability, access, and application. So, who here is familiar with <laughs> Will Smith eating spaghetti? It was a fairly traumatic experience. We all sort of you know, collectively had when uh, AI generated image, images were introduced. Um, these images were fairly uncanny, strange features, uh, human looking output, but in an eerie and unnatural way. Since last year, the image generation models have improved so much that the output looks a lot more realistic. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a series of images. With a show of hands, tell me if you think it's real or synthetic. Or, you know, tell me if you think it's synthetic. So, who thinks the first image is a synthetic? Who thinks the second image is synthetic? Who thinks the third image is synthetic? Okay, that was a trick question, they're all synthetic. <laughs> um, so, all of these were created with Midjourney. The prompt for the first one was Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel playing Fortnite. Uh, the second one was created by um, an artist called Joanne, um, and the prompt was something like Brad Pitt as a Wes Anderson movie character. Uh, apparently, she also created a she brand. Uh, there's a link in in the slides if you want to have a look later. And the last one is Pogba Puffa. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing how good this, uh, the output has become over the last couple of years. And there are so many creative uh, ways this content can be used. So what changed? ChatGPT has popularized the concept of conversational AI, leading to a shift in how users interact with digital services. Instead of navigating through menus and buttons and clicks and highlights, users can just now just engage in natural language conversation to accomplish the task, to retrieve information, or get whatever output that you're looking for. It has become conversational, making everybody 
with a little bit of practice and expert in AI. It is also a UX revolution. It has changed how we interact with machines. Today, accomplishing an AI-driven tasks cost only a fraction of what it did in the past. This reduction in expenses has made AI technology more accessible and affordable for a wide range of applications. In the past, if you had to create a character like Golem, you would need a very highly skilled artist, maybe a couple, multiple drafts and revisions, significant time and investment, specialized equipment and software tools. Today, with an AI-powered image generative tool, you can just put in a description of Golem into an AI model, and within seconds, it will generate uh, you know, multiple variations of Golem very quickly. The process is faster, cheaper, and requires less human intervention. And the output is amazing. It's hyper-realistic. So, AI, in my opinion, has breezed through the uncanny valley. Uncanny valley is the negative emotion people have when they see robots that look almost human. While the feeling is probably, you know, normally associated with robots, it is also felt with generative AI output. In its journey through the valley, AI-generated content depicts outputs like human in unsettling ways like Will Smith or that image there with the face and the hand all sort of morphed into one or six fingers. But the image of Pope in the puffer was a moment when we all kind of felt hoodwinked. Is, is it better to use it or not use it? I don't know if it's worth use it. Okay. So the image of Pope and the Papa was a moment we all kind of felt hoodwinked by AI, believing it to be a genuine photograph of the Pope. The hi this highlights how difficult it has been to distinguish between real and AI-generated media. Some experts describe this incident as the first real mass-level AI misinformation case. In my opinion, that was the moment when text-to-image models crossed the uncanny valley. It's too real. The output reached a point that was so hyper-realistic that it confused so many, so many people. Experts and tech-savvy people were fooled. So we haven't crossed it. Though we have crossed it for text-to-image. I don't think we have crossed it for text-to-video just yet. The output is still a little bit, you know, uncanny. Um, you couldn't just give a prompt like "Show Golem climbing Mount Doom" and expect the kind of um, output that you would get. Um, from a high production movie, but it's only a matter of time. I think we'll get there fairly quickly. So AI indeed has a significant impact on the world through its ability to generate hyper-realistic output. This makes it hard to e uh, for even AI literate and digital savvy folks to discern AI generated content from organic content. The ease of use, the scale, and the hyper-realistic output affects our reality. If not clearly disclosed, AI content can erode digital trust in digital media and public discourse. As synthetic content becomes more sophisticated, it challenges our ability to distinguish authentic from artificial information. The, uncer the uncertainty may decrease overall trust in digital platforms and information sources. It's crucial for creators and platforms to be transparent about AI use for users to understand its implications. So what can we do? How do we reclaim our reality? <laughs> that image cracks me up every time. Um, how do we build digital trust again? Labeling content. Content labels are like warning labels uh, in addressing misleading and deceptive content online. How fact-checking labels to post identify misinformation can help reduce uh, likelihood, likelihood of people believing and further sharing it. Similarly, labeling AI-generated media can temper the negative effects of this content. Be specific. Um, if possible, provide the details of which AI technology was used. Something like this image was generated with the help of Midjourney. Uh, explain the role of AI. Clarify how AI was used in the content creation process. Was it used for generating video, um, visual effects, editing, voiceover, the entire video, translations?
The more information you can provide, the more transparent your content will be. Educate your audience. Use this as an opportunity to educate your audience about the benefits and limitations of AI in content creation. This can foster a more informed and engaged user base. We can also bridge the digital and AI media literacy gap in more vulnerable population. Another thing you can do is digital watermarking. Embedding digital watermarks in images, videos, documents can verify the original creator or the owner of the content. This establishes authenticity, combats misinformation, or any unauthorized use. Uh, provenance tracking records the uh, full life cycle of data, including any transformations or changes. This creates um, an audit auditable trail uh, that enhances transparency and accountability. It acts as a nutrition label for your digital content, showing the origin, history, and modifications. It tells you if you are eating organic or genetically modified food, whether it has too much sodium or just the right amount of sodium for consumption for the day. It gives you a system to understand what you're ingesting for your mental nourishment. We can make more conscious choices about a mental diet. Um, it has to be a conscious, informed choice for users to engage with AI-generated content and not be opted into artificial content by default. So I'm not here to suggest a particular approach or a particular standard that you should follow. I'm just here to shed light on this topic and for you to inform yourselves Go research, go look at resources like C2PA or National Institute of Standards and Technology. See what's out there. Consider if it's the right tool for you and your organization. Join some working groups. Um, advocate. If these are not the right tools, then advocate for the right tools to be created and right regulations to be put in place. We have to invest in digital trust and create an infrastructure which all digital citizens can trust. As, a, as AI continues to shape the future of content, um, staying ahead of regulatory requirements and ethical practices is crucial. By implementing simple changes like adding labels, you can help ensure that your AI content creation is transparent and trustworthy. Here's an easy to remember takeaway I'm gonna share with you in the next slide uh, to help reclaim a reality and creating digital trust in the age of AI. So, LTE. <laughs> Label, track, and educate. And I just want to read out the label. I use, pres I use perplexity to come up with this acronym uh, and summarize the takeaways from my um, content in an easy to remember way. So, LTE. Label, clearly identify AI-generated content, and be transparent. Use watermarks. Um, implement provenance tracking to record the full life cycle and origins of digital content. And educate. Inform yourself, inform your audience about AI's role in content creation, and how having these labels are critical to evaluate digital content and digital media. And build that trust. By embracing a principle like LTE, we can foster a more transparent digital ecosystem, empower users to make informed choices about the content they consume, and ultimately reclaim our grasp on reality in an increasingly AI world. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? We don't, but it's only a matter of time. Okay, uh, so the question is, does NYPL use synthetic content? And the answer is not right now, but we get a lot of collections, we gather a lot of information to make accessible to our patrons. So it's only a matter of time before synthetic content will be part of our collections. So at this point, we are looking at what's the right thing for, for us to do to make sure we are transparent about how we present this information, 
The library is an authoritative source of data, so this matters a lot to us. We like to track provenance. We want to make sure we are telling you what it is, and it is what it is. So we are investing the time and effort to, to research this, figure out what are the right tool sets and um, standards we should be using. So we are part of uh, the National Institutes of Technology's um, AI working group uh, on, on synthetic content because we really care about how we present data and information to our patients. Was there another question? Yes. Hi, I'm Miriam from the NQ. So, you know, so I just wonder, um, it's a change management question. Uh, uh, what's the thing about the library? In terms of uh, using synthetic content or just, just uh, AI just in general? AI in general. That's a tricky question. You know, it, it, <laughs> we have a, a big sort of stakeholder set who, and they all have different sort of perspectives on it. Um, so we have an AI working group. I'm helping uh, do some work on that. Um, we are in the very early phases. We are in the education and experiment phase before we sort of decide what to use and you know what tools to open to our staff and to our patrons. Uh, we want to be very sure that it's the right tool and it's a thing that we can um, share with our staff and patrons, which sort of encourages digital trust because trust is is very important to the library. And uh, we are in the process of sort of figuring out what those right things are, talking to different stakeholders because. Some want to use the latest and greatest, and others don't want to use it at all. So we have to find the right balance, and we can only do that by educating ourselves. Thank you. Are you aware of any AI tools that can be used to detect if the image was AI generated? So um, it's not. A, there are there any tools that you can use to detect if the image was AI generated? So there are some tools which are available. Google Lens kind of does that for you. Um, C2PA has some tools as well which can help you track the authenticity and provenance if that has been added to the, um, to the image or video. Uh, so there are some tools out there, but uh, they're not very accurate at this point. It's a bit of a hit and miss. You have to sort of see, try, and validate all the answers that you kind of get from those tools right now. Last question: uh, is, is watermarking? Is there a way to prevent the watermark from being removed? Sorry, could you repeat With that? Watermarking. You mentioned watermarking. Yes. With those techniques, is there a way to prevent the watermarking from being removed? I mean, it's not. It's not a foolproof way, but you know, uh, if somebody's willing to spend their time to remove it, then they will. <laughs> uh, it's it's a hard. I mean, it's it's a recommendation. People will find ways to you know break all the systems that are set in place to, to um, use the information as they want. Uh, but we can do our best to sort of make sure we are doing the right things. Even setting clear standards, I think, is, you know, if we all think this is what, what we've decided is ethically okay, that's what most people tend to call us. So I like that. Yes. Like the idea of AI is out there, you're the Thank you. So if there are no other questions, thank you very much. <laughs>